I'd like to tell you about a little incident uh, that I had, a conversation I had on a plane one day, flying out of Minneapolis, heading back to my home in Michigan. Uh, but before I do that, I'd like to quote one scripture to you. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19. I'm using the NIV because most of the other translations uh, use words like imputing and reckoning, which are not words in common currency anymore. And uh, so it's a little simpler to understand what's being said. But we read there that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Enough big words in, in the verse as it is. But the idea here is that God is reaching out to embrace sinners and bring them to himself. And he's not holding what they've done against them in a way that would alienate them from him. He has set about to fix the problem. And through Christ, as we read here, God has provided a solution. Christ was made sin for us. He took the judgment we deserved so that it could be taken out of the way. The Bible says he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And the moment I accept this amazing offer that Christ took my place as the sinner and took the judgment for me, I feel the embrace of God. I feel that he takes me in and receives me. And the fact is that we who have already known the embrace of God, like the prodigal coming home and the father running and throwing his arms around him and covering him in kisses, to us has been committed the message of reconciliation. We're out there seeking to convince people that God is not their enemy, that he's their best friend, and that he wants to be their father, and he wants to receive them. And if only they will accept his solution, our sin has separated between us and God. And God wants that removed, and that's why he provided Christ. And when we accept Christ as that sin bearer, he takes it out of the way, and then we know the embrace of God himself. Well, I was flying, as I said, out of Minneapolis, and there had been a delay in the flight. A lot of times high winds in Chicago or something like that might delay the flight back up the way in Minneapolis. And uh, it gave me an opportunity to sit and to look around the waiting room and see my fellow passengers. And I noticed right away there was a priest there, and uh, he was in serious conversation with an older woman. And I prayed for him, and I prayed that perhaps I might have an opportunity to share this message of reconciliation with him. And uh, I had been upgraded to first class. I did a lot of travel in those days, and, and so they they bumped me up to first class. And uh, I had seat 2B, the aisle seat in the second row. Uh, I had gone in early, and I was I was sitting on the plane. When he came down the aisle, a lot of other people had come in first. Perhaps he was finishing his conversation. I don't know. But as he came down the aisle, he was looking at his card, at his uh, boarding pass, and he was saying to no one in particular, uh, they must have made a mistake because they had also upgraded him to first class. And he was in 2A. And so I stood up to put his bag over in the overhead bin and allow him to slip into his spot. And I said to him, no, I don't think they made a mistake at all. And he said, why do you say that? And I said, well, because I saw you in the waiting room and I prayed for you. And I prayed that we might be able to have a conversation today. And he said, well, that's very interesting. 
what do you want to talk about? And I said, well, I would like to talk about the gospel as it was preached by the church at Rome in the first century. And he said, how do you know what that was? And I said, well, happily, there's a book in our New Testament that was written to the Romans in the first century, and it explains the gospel that was preached at Rome. And so he was very animated in this. Well, as we were sitting, starting the conversation, the steward came down, and they always offer drinks to the first-class passengers. And uh, so he came to our row, and I asked for an apple juice. And uh, the, the priest said, that sounds good. I'll have an apple juice as well. And then he stopped and said, no, give me a Virgin Mary. Okay, so that's for the uninitiated, a Bloody Mary without the alcohol. And the guy, the steward said, uh, a virgin, Mary? He said, I'll, I'll bring you the whole thing and you can do what you want with it. And so he came back and he gave him his drink of uh, spiced tomato juice and he gave him a little bottle of liquor. The man didn't say anything, just put the liquor in his pocket. And soon the fellow came back again and offered him some more liquor. And he said to me, you know, it's a funny thing. He said, everybody assumes because I'm a priest that I drink alcohol. He said, I'm actually a chaplain in the military, but I don't drink. And he, he said, as he shook this pocket full of bottles, he said, I'm going to a convention of chaplains. And he said, I'll be very popular there because he had all these little bottles of liquor in his, in his pocket. Well, eventually the fellow came back and he let the priest know that he was of the same religion. And so we just nodded our heads. And after a little bit, he came along and he made some snide comment about a young woman who'd gone by with a very uh, short skirt and sort of wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you see. And then sometime later, he came back again and he said to us, like, what are you talking about so seriously? And the priest said, we're talking about the Bible. And the man said, you know, I've heard that they're, they're coming out with a new Bible that has removed all the myths. And I said, well, like, what myths are those? And he said, well, like Abraham and Moses and I said, well, that's very interesting. I said, you know, Jesus didn't think they were myths. He said, Moses wrote of me. And he said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and was glad. He thought they were real people. He thought Adam was a real person. And the fellow just kind of grunted and walked off. I said to the priest, does this concern you a bit? I mean, here's a man who's let you know that he belongs to this religion, and he's come back three times to talk to us, once about liquor, once about a woman with a short skirt, and once that the Bible's full of mess. I said, uh, does, that, does that concern you? I haven't sensed one shred of evidence that this man knows anything about God. And he sighed and he said, you know, when we go into these big churches with their stained glass windows and their flying buttresses and their 15 foot tall candelabras, it's pretty hard to find Jesus there. Wow. I said, you know, I, I had a friend who grew up in the church and and he told me that actually his religion didn't help him get to God. It actually got in the way of coming to God. And he said, that young man was a smart young man. He said, I think that really is the truth. And as we flew along, we, we discussed uh, 
Paul's discussion of justification and sanctification. And I said, you know, I've spent a lot of time knocking on doors in Ireland and talking to people there. Lovely people, gracious people, hospitable. They'll invite you in for a cup of tea and they don't even know you. But I said, what I've noticed is that they seem to have the cart for the horse. They, they seem to have confused justification and sanctification. And as a result, they're trying to live the life before he gives the life. You must first receive the life as a gift before you can live it. You can't live it till he gives it. And as we went through the scripture, he, he clung to my hand and he said, I need to understand this. This is the message of reconciliation. God doesn't wait until we improve sufficiently to throw his arms around us. He doesn't come, as Jesus said, like the Father and say to the Son, listen, fellow, you go get cleaned up, take a shower, change your clothes, and, and after a while I may have uh, an opportunity to talk with you, but just keep your distance right now until you get in shape. None of that. No. What, what the Lord says is that the father ran, and, and here was a man stinking of the pigs, dressed in rags, and he threw his arms around him as is. And that's the message of the gospel. God takes us as is, and he gives us new life. He declares us to be right because of the sacrifice of Christ. And then begins the process of actually making us right. But Jesus is the door. In other words, God receives us on the front end and invites us into a relationship right at the beginning. And then while we enjoy that relationship, he gently works with us to bring us into conformity to his own blessed Son.